Okay. Hey, Ruthie's here. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to 100% Isolated. It's me, George, today, and I'm about to invite in the wonderful Ruth Goller for a little chat. So stay with us. Hope everyone's doing all right. There she is. Hey, Ruthie. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? It worked. Yay. Yeah, I know. I'm quite impressed, How's actually. I've... Have you ever done anything like this before? No. Mm. No. <laughs> no, I've seen loads of people doing it recently, and I was just like, yeah, apparently it's easy. Here we go. How are you doing? How are you getting on? I'm good, yeah. I'm good. Just having my third afternoon coffee. <laughs> nice. Wow. I'm trying to keep it down to one a day at the moment, and I'm just about making it, but that means I'm drinking gallons and gallons of tea. <laughs> so it's like, it's a bit of a trade-off, you know. <laughs> just trying to set up my camera. So what's life looking like for you at the moment? What are you up to? Oh, it's really good. Um, check this out. Oof. Beautiful. That yeah. is exceptional. Yeah, I'm quite lucky myself, actually. Like, having a garden right now is... Uh, I've never valued it as much as this before. It's amazing. Amazing. It's so nice to be... Yeah, I'm a bit out of London, so I've got lots of green... Yeah, the green it's green belt. Yeah. yeah. Around you. Beautiful. Yeah. So you're getting out a lot and walking and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do lots of walking. I do a walk every day. Nice. Yeah. Because we're right at the end, at the edge of town, so it's really easy to... I don't know if you've been to our house or... Once. Yeah, yeah. Me and John Scott popped in fairly late notice unannounced a couple of years ago, I think. And I spent the afternoon with Kit in the pub. But you had to go somewhere as soon as we turned up, I think. So we didn't really get to hang. But yeah, it's beautiful out there. Yeah. Have you been to our house? I can't, sorry, you just cut off a bit, so I couldn't hear. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I did once. Yeah, we popped in, uh, kind of unannounced, and you had to go somewhere, I think, and then I hung out with Kim for a little bit. But it's a beautiful part of the world, yeah. you know, being yeah. so far removed. I mean, you, I guess, started life. I'm moving into interview mode now. Uh, in the countryside, more or less, fairly remotely, in Brixton. Yeah. yeah so is that something that that's? <laughs> I have. I've been to that very house. Is that something that's really like that's important to you to have? fairly natural surroundings and you know how was that I guess coming up growing up in the countryside Ooh. are we having some connection issues yeah and I don't know whether it's you or me I'm just going to move a little bit inside I was trying to kind of keep away from Bridges teaching a lesson next door so I don't want to like get too much piano in the mix but maybe I'm a bit far away from the internet Okay. Maybe we're good now. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it's you and not me. <laughs> yeah, it's always me. Because I wouldn't know what to do, what to do different. So we got. Yeah, We've just got a soldier on, I think. We'll be grand. So yeah, like um, growing up in the countryside, natural spaces, things like that. Was it? You were a very outdoors person. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it was a very small town in the Alps in in northern Italy, and well. Maybe not that well. As small as Cheshire meets where I live now, probably about twenty thousand people. You know, right? Yeah. There's sort of lot, lots of little um, fractions of the town that are up on on the mountains, which also kind of belong to the town. So yeah, it is, it is quite small, I suppose. But you know, it's really we're right in the middle of woodlands and the map. It's in a valley. You've seen it it's in a valley. So yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's well, it's, it's particularly beautiful. Away on the mountains you only have to get in a car if you want to you know so it's really yeah it's a pretty stunning part of the world anyway isn't it it's, those, those mountains are incredible it was a very happy memory a few years ago when you when you were curating the uh, uh a lot of the gigs for the city Roll jazz festival and a load of us went out there and like kind of one gig would be in the town center somewhere another gig would be up in the mountains at like a cable car depot yeah. and like just kind of traveling around and making music it was beautiful yeah so it was so nice to have you all there. It was, it was really good fun. It was a very happy time. <laughs> <laughs> so keeping my kind of interview hat on, like, obviously there's a very, well, it's pretty, like, I wouldn't say remote, but not a kind of big city life growing up. So w at what point did did music come to you, or how did you find it being where you were, and in what shape? Well, I've always 
you know, my parents were always always pushed me to play music as a child already. It was always very important. Um, oh, we lost her. Can you hear me? Uh, I can now. Yeah, you dropped out for a minute there. I wonder whether that's me or not. It might be, but uh, let me sit back a little bit. Maybe that's better. You were saying your parents were very keen for you to make music when you were younger. Yeah, so I always played something, you know. I started with the violin, mm. like six. Wow. I was enthusiastic for a few years and then less. <laughs> yeah. And I started playing a bit of piano, you know, and always singing in choirs as well, like even church uh -huh. choirs or music school yeah. choirs. Because so, in where I grew up, it's not like music isn't really integrated in, in school like that, you know, if you... If your kids want to do music, it's a separate institution in the afternoon where you, where they go. Right. It's really like, who's lucky enough that their parents see the point in that and want want kids to go there? That's. Mm. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. Uh... The people who were lucky to go there, including yourself, but the church choir as well, was that like a family thing? Were you doing choral, like, like kind of choral music, like yeah, big yeah, works yeah. and things like that? Well, no, not really. I mean, you know, sort of children's choir kind of thing. But yeah, mm -hmm. church, religious tunes, you know, it's a Catholic area, so kind of right. got, sing, got sung at mass and, you know, nothing, nothing major, but, you know. I was always involved in doing music, basically, from, from early on. Yeah. And so then, it sounds like if, you know, if you... Sorry, go on. No, you, you go on, it's fine. <laughs> um, you're saying it's something that, like, kind of not everyone has the privilege to um, to access, or you're very lucky if your parents kind of push you to get involved in that. But once once you kind of are, there's there's a lot of things going on, and there's, there's still a fairly rich musical community by the sounds of things. Yeah, You definitely. had quite a lot happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's, I think it's a very musical area, you know, in general. I mean, it is sort of very, it's, it is quite cut off because it's in the Alps. And I think in general as a people, it's, 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 everything's quite cut off, you know, they're used to mm. their own, you know, people that didn't really, I mean, recently, obviously, yeah, in the last sort of 50, 60 years, but before that, people didn't really travel and, you know, no. like my grandma has never, been out of her town just because that's not something you do you you live yeah. like 1500 meters up on the mountain and you, you know you just don't go out <laughs> of your, yeah. from your little town really because yeah that's where everything is so until so i would say very re last generation um it was all quite secluded you know and quite um, close communities yeah which yeah. means each, each valley has got a really strong identity right whether it's, whether it's language wise or whether it's also musical wise you know we got three languages there and mm. we um each valley's got the really strongly their own sort of dialect songs you know and yeah which are still probably still pretty much like they were a long time ago just because there wasn't really a mix mix happening so um yeah just physical isolation yeah not so different to now in some ways, I guess. <laughs> Maybe we'll all have totally different accents by the end of this. I guess we're a lot more connected in some ways. So, I mean, a lot of people have, have sort of hinted towards questions like this of like, at what point? Well, we haven't got to the bass yet, actually, I don't think. We were doing uh, violin and piano and you've always been singing, which people who know you from MIT will know already if they don't know your other projects. So at what point? What happened next? Yeah. Well, then... Um... When I was a teenager, I met some people that had bands, you know, like punk bands and stuff. And, and I started um, getting into playing guitar, but I didn't really know anything about music, like in terms of what notes are, or you know, because even the way when I played violin or when I played the piano, I didn't, there wasn't really any theory lessons or harmony. Right. You know, I didn't know anything about that. It was all kind of reading from the sheet. Mm -hmm. So... I didn't really know anything about functional harmony at all. You know, it was completely instinctive, and and I just got into playing guitar at first. Mm -hmm. 
And was, someone showed me how to do a power chord and off you go, you know. So yeah. the whole, whole world opened and I just started writing tunes and started, yeah. It, I, I actually think back to that time quite fondly because, you know, having then gone to music school afterwards and having learned all that, um, you're kind of, there is that innocence and that, yeah. that, that, yeah. That you lose, that you lose somehow, isn't it? It's, yeah, you uh, can't really get that back. Sort of once you've peered behind the curtain, you 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 can choose to not be constrained by it, or you can deliberately try and write atonally. I mean, we'll get onto like writing and stuff, I guess, in a bit. But um, it's always there, isn't it? Somehow, and yeah. certain things that are just sonically meant to lead to other things, and you might have followed that path naturally as a youngster or someone with less information, and it was really satisfying, and now it's a thing. And like it has its own baggage that comes with that. There's a lot of hang-ups with that, you know. I'm, I I feel similarly like when you were sort of almost naively finding your way. There was something very pure about it. Yeah. I mean, one yeah. anyone, yeah, yeah. So, like, what were you introduced to punk music by them, or was it something you checked out already, or? No, by them really. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, then there wasn't any internet, there wasn't any... Yeah, right. There wasn't really, there was a few record shops, so unless someone gave you a tape or unless someone, you know, lent you some music, there wasn't really, I didn't really have any access to music mm -hmm. at all when I was growing up, you know. Yeah. So it was really that group of people that I met and then get, you know, started like, they lent me CDs or lent me, lent me tapes and stuff. And, and What kind uh, of stuff? Well... I, I really was into like sort of punk hardcore like Dead Kennedys was my favourite mm. band you know or Wicked. like uh, but yeah also like Bad Religion and Pennywise uh -huh. and and then later I, I got a bit into like West Coast surf punk <laughs> <laughs> like no effects and things like that okay into as well yeah yeah, I always thought of that as like skater punk. I didn't really know. I had a bit of like, there were probably members of MYD watching this at the moment who were going to be like, fucking hell, because I don't really know a lot about that like, hardcore scene. Like Dead Kennedys, I, I've had a little bit of probably, but um, yeah, the skater punk thing was my my sort of Did angry. you listen to that as well? Yeah, kind of like, well, when I was really young, actually, like Green Day, Offspring and things like that. Okay. And uh, no effects definitely made the thing. And then, it, then from, from like my teenage years, Although it never like combined with any of my music, it kind of there was a there was a big new metal thing for a while, like Corn, Deftones, oh, yeah. System right. of a Down, bands like that, kind of just like really, really energetic music or quite dark music, and it was like a totally different thing. When you're that age, I think you hear something like that, and it's like it speaks to you in a way that other music hasn't yet done yeah. that, you know. Definitely, yeah. So you guys would start playing together then, inspired by these sounds that you were all checking out and stuff yeah yeah we started I started writing music you know which was something I'd never done before and and yeah now when I listen back to that stuff it, I really like it because it's so weird <laughs> yeah were you singing as well then yeah I was singing and just sort of playing random guitar <laughs> nice oh, that's amazing man but, you should put yeah. some of it up yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, we had some other bands, you know, there was more projects then that came up and it was so much fun. Like we played like local gigs around the area and it was, it was really, really great fun, you know. Was there an audience for that kind of music? Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, people put on like little festivals. I mean, they still do that now, you know, little sort of village festivals or town festivals mm. and mm. four or five bands playing or... I, you know, the local youth centre, they organise this uh, this project each year called uh, Die Rampe, which is a thing where they invited like four or five bands to record an EP. Wow. And put some tracks on a CD and, um, and, and then put it out as a CD, you know. That's pretty hip. Yeah, and that was, that's where I, did, where I had like my first recording experience in the studio, you know. It all seemed like incredible at the time <laughs> yeah yeah i bet i mean that's i don't know when i had that experience but for the first time but it would have been probably substantially later than that 
and even listening to a bit of Pete and Adam talking yesterday and Pete talking about when he was first in London, like that was a lot less accessible as a thing than it is now, you know, like mm -hmm. just being able to, well, like now people can record themselves or you can just find a nice room and get like someone great, like Alex Bonnie to come with some nice mics and you've got a record in like a few hours if you do it right. But yeah. when yeah. things were all like, you needed a record deal and you needed this and Chris is just listing uh, new metal albums. White Pony, I didn't know that one so well when I wasn't around the first. Anyway, sorry, Ruth. Um, Where can you, that? can you see what he's Yeah, like? I think that might be because I'm hosting it on the MYD oh. thing. I get these like these little irritants popping up just under your chin. <laughs> 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 trying, to, trying to block it out. Sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, it wasn't maybe such an accessible thing then, like recording. And it's such a, I, I don't know how you felt at that age, but I always feel like a band isn't really a band until, or like recording music does so much for your understanding of how it works and how it comes across and like how you will play it together and stuff like that. It's such a, such a like a formative element of any project or, you know, something like that, you know, your own development in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, totally. I really agree. So what age were you when this kind of stuff was kicking off? Uh, probably about 15, 16, 17, you know. Well, yeah. That kind of age, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what came next? Well, um, those were sort of the dark school years, you know. We finished school at like 18, uh, it's like, mm -hmm. like the equivalent of doing A-levels or something. Um, so that band, we had until until then you know and we all went to school together so um, mm -hmm. um so that kind of finished after that because people go to study and you know and so did i and right. uh, i just knew because i think because of that experience actually i knew i wanted to perform you know and also i didn't say at the end of those years in that band i started playing bass so right, the yeah. very last year And was that like, that felt like a quite a natural, oh, we lost her again. She'll be back, folks, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, was that, that was, uh, was that quite a natural fit for you when you first came to the base? How did that feel? Like, you felt Great. like that yeah. was it or, yeah. Yeah, I really liked it. I just, it just really suited me much better than playing guitar somehow. I'm, you know, I like the single line thing. I, I find chords. Mm -hmm. I, it's much easier for me to understand one line still now. I find like <laughs> yeah. guitar or piano um, playing seems like it's it's very difficult for me to think in many lines, you know, at once and be quick at it, you know. Yeah, I can't understand how people do that as well. I've always been a single line person. Like when I gave up the piano, oh, I think we've lost it again. Fuck. When I uh, stopped studying the piano as a kid, that was a very happy moment for me. So stressful, lots of notes. Hey, so Sorry, you're. I just lost you, you there. No, it's okay. I was just waffling, okay? so um, it's fine. I think that our viewers hopefully will have stayed with us. Um, so you're playing the bass. Yeah, so I started playing the bass, loved it, and then I was just like, I, you know, it kind of happened coincidentally. My school years came to an end, mm -hmm. and like. I, need, I want to go study something and I just wanted, I knew that I wanted to perform, you know, I wanted to be a performer and play in bands. So that was kind of clear at that, at that age. Mm. So I obviously coming from this tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, well, musically, you know, it's a great place, but you know, you can't like go to a music school or something like study music or you can't do that there. Right. So, um, I decided to No. Oh, I think I'm freezing a bit earlier than she is. How we go. I wonder whether I should go somewhere else in the house, but yeah. we have good internet, so hold on, I'm gonna move around a bit. Yeah. Um Let's see if this works better. Okay. We get a little tour of your house as well, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> the colors. This is a yeah, it's beautiful. Room. Yeah, and then um, I decided to go somewhere, go study music somewhere, because I knew I didn't really know anything about music, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to know, sort of, I wanted to learn what I was doing. And um, oh, for fuck's sake! 
Aye, aye, aye. Stay with us, folks. Assuming that I'm still there as well. I don't know if I actually am. Um, hopefully we'll have Ruth back very soon. <laughs> hey. Okay, I'm going to go downstairs. Hold on. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there one room at a time. Yeah, okay. This is the yellow room. Nice. With looks lovely. Beautiful. Okay. Sit right next to the router, so hopefully that will help. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Cool. There's a tiny bit of a delay on you, but I think we're getting back in there. Okay, let's try. Okay. Yeah, so I decided to come to London. Coinc con complete coincidence, you know, didn't really know anybody. Um, I mean, I moved with my boyfriend at the time. We both okay. moved here. And um, I went to a place called the London Music School uh -huh. for a year, which is like an introduction kind of music course, you know. Right. But it was really great, you know. I, I hardly knew how to play at that point, as you can imagine. You know, I just like play some punk bass lines, but that was it. I didn't know anything, you know. Right. And really that year, I was just at that place from 9 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night, having different lessons, you know, learning about, starting to learn about harmony, starting to learn about reading, different kinds of music. I suddenly heard all this music that obviously coming from the Alps I've never right, yeah, heard of before, you know. Got into jazz, like heard John Coltrane and was Ooh. totally blown away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big one. Everyone needs that at some point in their lives. Yeah. What kind of stuff were they? Was it like, you know, you say that you were learning about harmony and stuff. Were you having specific harmony lessons? Were people like taking you through the history of classical music or what kind of... Uh, what kind of thing was going on? No, not really classical music. More like sort of jazz harmony, you know, the mm -hmm. basic kind of beginnings of that. And just yeah. learning how to get through a chord progression or, you know, a lot of pop pop stuff as well. Yeah. Pop songs or um, just analysing, you know, it's kind of simple harmony in that way. But quite a bit of sort of basic jazz harmony as well, you know, which mm -hmm. for me was like, okay, I'm... This is making a lot of sense now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Filling in the filling in the gaps kind of thing. Yeah, totally. Did you did you have lessons as the basis at the same time or was it purely like kind of academic yeah. catch up or No, I had at, at at that school there was a guy called Nico Gomez, which is mm. an incredible bass player. Um he was my teacher and um he really uh, Pete knows him as well. Pete plays with him a lot, so um, Right. I went to see them a few times. They used to play in a Latin band together. Mm. And, um, but yeah, so he just, he's a really, he really knows his stuff, you know. He, he knows a, a lot of stuff in sort of general music. So mm -hmm. he's just been really great teaching about technique, teaching about harmony, reading, you know, all this. We had loads and loads of lessons with him. And then obviously, wow. And lessons as well and you know so in that year I think I think I learned like I, I learned the most I've ever learned probably in my right. life in, in, in that kind of amount of time you know right yeah. it's just the total just, binge of information and right yeah and playing was this playing the first time playing jazz and so yeah was it was um, was jazz starting to become a thing for you then at that point? You was kind of learning the harmony of it and stuff. But we, was that your first experience playing in that way? Yeah. And was it still just was it still electric bass at this point? Yeah, always electric bass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So learning tunes and starting to play with people and yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Wow. And so, like, you discovered John Coltrane and all this amazing music, and it's like, were you? Was it were there all these people just fellow students on this course, or were you venturing out and seeing and meeting musicians at gigs in London, or like how were you finding these people and your kind of playing colleagues? Yeah, not that much actually. M mainly playing with people at school. I think it was just mm. quite because I was there all day, you know. So um, mm. I didn't really do it. I wasn't really good enough to oh, do gigs at that point. You know, I couldn't have done 
I couldn't have like done a gig or something or you know or we wouldn't I wouldn't have time to build up something outside that school either because I was there all day from like nine to seven and you know yeah and projects there so um so it was kind of closed in that way you know I didn't really I didn't, I didn't really explore London at that point you know at all I mean I went to see mm -hmm. the okay but that was really it so it was really just playing, but you know, it was a school, so it was like 40, 50 people there and we were all having different projects and yeah. learning different stuff, so. Nice. And so, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I guess, I don't know what to, I mean, we'll just carry on with this journey if that's all right with you. Like, at what point, yeah, I mean, what, what happened after the London School of Music, I guess, let's, let's just keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so after that, I um, I was a bit lost, to be honest. I was a bit like, um, you know, I didn't I didn't really have a job. I didn't really earn any money, which, and at that point, I, start, I needed to s start earning money if I wanted to stay in London. And so I couldn't really afford staying, to be honest. So mm -hmm. I decided to go back home. Uh, and I went back home for a year, and I just worked in a bars and you know as, as waitress mainly mm -hmm. and kept practicing so mm -hmm. i practiced quite a lot actually during that time as well while i was working and i just put some money together for that year saved some money and then decided to come back to london and study jazz because i really got into jazz and i felt like i've only just scratched the surface you know i still felt like i didn't really know anything about it or you know at that yeah. point, I really wanted to be a jazz musician. <laughs> right. Amazing. <laughs> Which never happened then. But... <laughs> <laughs> it never does, I think. <laughs> it's like this kind of mirage in the desert. Yeah. Like there's you know, finally a way in. Well, I, I can't imagine ever feeling like I really know how to play jazz. You know, there's so much stuff and study and it's such a, such a serious pursuit for so many people. I mean, it is for me and it has been, but it can be a bit intimidating sometimes. Yeah. But oh, so was this middle, was this middle sex that you were, that you decided yeah. to come in when you yeah. came back? And so actually what I wanted to ask there was like, in a way, your experiences in that year at the London School of Music were pretty like dedicated to just soaking up as much information as possible and playing as much as possible. So what was it that made you want to come back to London? Because you could have gone any place else, I guess, but was there something because you, you said you didn't really get out that much you maybe saw a couple of gigs was there something particular that just maybe made you think that's what's calling me i need to get back there or mm, yeah i just i think i think because it was comfortable and mm -hmm. i knew the place a little bit you know mm -hmm. and it's it's tough like starting off in a new country you know somewhere where you don't know the language because when i first came to england I hardly spoke any English and, you know, it's, it's tough. You, you, yeah, I bet. So I already made that step once and I felt like if I come back here, I've done a lot of the hard work already, you know. Yeah, yeah. If I've gone some, like, I don't know, to Paris or something, I would have had to do the same thing again. And It's exhausting, you know. And I knew a few people here, you know, I made a few connections, obviously, during that year. Some of the yeah, people of course. I went to school with were still here, so, you know, I had some friends and, so, yeah, and also I hadn't really explored London enough to be yeah, honest. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I knew about Middlesex. I had a friend that I made this friend at, at that music school, and he told me about Middlesex, and he he decided to go there as well. So you know, it was like for me, it was it was someone for me to go with, and yeah, so you had an ally not completely by yourself and having because yeah i wasn't so it was kind of a lazy decision but you know i mean i can totally <laughs> i can totally identify with that like i've been somewhat envious sometimes of friends who just like go somewhere else for a while but then i think like it does take a long time to really settle into a place and especially if you're playing music and you're on a scene or something like really great people really great people can come to london for like maybe two years while they're studying or while their partner's studying or something and they barely play a gig even you know because yeah. it's just yeah, yeah. like it's tough to get in 
on things and like to do that work is, oh is it's it's no small feat you know like putting in that groundwork and getting to know people and actually feeling comfortable because if you're going to play music and you're not like confident or uh you're, you're questioning too many things or you're just not feeling at home like that's not really a great recipe either it's like yeah I've thought about it many times where I would go and me and Bridge have talked about it but mm. I don't think either of us could really see leaving here now because it's just you you plant your roots in a way and I'm sure that year for you at the, at the school was like no different in a sense you were you were ticking off a lot of things and like climbing a lot of obstacles you know first time around in a new place yeah, yeah, oh, completely. I mean, language being the main thing, you know. Yeah. And just realizing how everything works. I mean, first of all, it's the first time I moved out of home. Yeah, I already right. Already a huge step, you know, and I, I moved out of home into a different country where I hardly spoke the language, so yeah. it's it's a lot of things to... <laughs> Man, <laughs> my... In, in that year. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, that's pretty it's deep. Rich, you know? I, I have fun memories of it. It's not like... I think of it as a really tough time, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun and, you know. How old were you at this point then? Like 19, 20 or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after school, yeah. yeah. And, um, and then I came, back to, I came back to go to Middlesex after that. So I yeah. was there for three. And I think that's when I really started, like, you know, gigging and playing out, doing gigs and working as a musician mm -hmm. as well you know I hadn't really done before and um yeah again as as you just said you know just it was so easy to to find my roots and to find my social circle through mm -hmm. a university which you know a, a lot of my friends that maybe came a, a lot of people that I know come to London and want to play and want to do gigs and stuff and they they find it impossible because you've just got no way in yeah. Whereas if you go through an institution, I had a social structure from immediately, you know, and someone gets a gig yeah. in the bar next to the campus or whatever, and you start playing, and you know, and then you you live with your friends, you you know, it's it's such a great thing. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people, yeah, as you say, as you said before, a lot of really good musicians fail in London because they don't have, yeah. you know, or it's it's either you you. You go through a school like that, or you just go to loads of jam sessions, and you know, yeah, and are That's... also really social. And, and I'm not, I'm not someone that can just, I don't know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I wasn't gonna say and, and like talk to a lot of people, you know, I'm not, I'm not comfortable in that way. So, yeah, it, it for me, it was, it was, it really worked really well meeting people like this, you know. Yeah, I had a, I had a, when I was at uni before I moved to London to do music, I had a, a supervisor in my third year who was a great guy actually. And he used to even teach like music history at the academy. And he was saying to me like, man, just, just, um, just find out who you want to have lessons with and move to London and shed and go and see these people and go to stuff. And it's like, even though it was really expensive and, mm -hmm. you know, I had to beg, borrow and steal to get fees and stuff. I wanted to be in that place where, it's just all there, isn't it? And like you do a day of college and then you go for a pint and then maybe you even play a few tunes and it's like, it's all wrapped in, into one and people are living in these big shared houses where yeah, people yeah. can play a lot. And there's a, there's a sort of resourceful focused, like industrious thing going on. You're in, you're in yeah. with people making music and you kind of try and follow their good habits and not be scared off by their good habits and all these things. Yeah. I think it was a it was a very big thing for me as well. Like, just... you, did you you went to you went to the academy, but you did a postgrad there, right? Yeah, yeah. I did an English degree before that, so I had a big I had big hang ups about like not having spent the last three years playing music and and stuff like that. So, so too, so good to get into the academy without having been at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I was very lucky. I mean, this is, we should save some of this for my interview on Friday because the way we should be talking about you. But I mean, I was lucky in the same way that you had your punk friends. Give us a glimpse. Uh, Give us a glimpse. Yeah, well, I'll give a, yeah, a little teaser. Uh, in the same way that you had your punk pals when you were a teenager, I had 
a lot of jazz music pals and like there was a little a little group of people around my school and around a student big band I played with like Kit obviously Kit's Ruth's husband for anyone who doesn't know and Freddie Gavita and uh, Lewis Wright some amazing musicians who are who are who are all doing wonderful things now so already by the like they all went to music college and I went and did something else so I think if I hadn't got my grades to go to uni, I was going to take a year out and apply for music college. Mm-hmm. But then when I was studying, I just, I didn't even practice really. It was one of my big regrets because I used to always like my defense, this is getting into me, into being me, isn't it? A defense, oh, my defense to, for doing shit at my English degree was like, oh, I'm going to be a musician. But then at the same time, I wasn't really doing any music. So but there were people playing and I would set up gigs and whenever there was a uni gig, I would get my friends from London to come down who were already studying. So I tried to keep those relationships and that flame kind of going. And I did play while I was there and stuff, but it was, uh, it just wasn't a very focused time. I was 20, 20, 19, 20. I was like just being a student, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Amazing. <laughs> I find that so impressive. Like, to, to learn I find, you know I feel I the same way when you, talk about like when you actually outline for me like the various things one has to overcome and just leaving home and going to a completely new country and uh, you know getting proficient in a new language and learning a new musical language like all of that sounds to me like a far more impressive feat I have to say yeah but then you know I didn't really have a choice because you 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 grew up in Norwich which is like a couple of hours from London yeah exactly maybe yeah. I had had London a couple of hours from my house I would have probably done that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah, wasn't... some sort of centre. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's. I think it's all very impressive anyway. So would you say at Middlesex, like, everything started to click into place even more? You really kind of found your your vibe? Yeah, my vibe. <laughs> Definitely. I'll give you a, t- a Tyrolean um, <laughs> V there. Well... I was really bad when I, like, I could hardly play a walking bass line. I've got no idea how I got into that course, seriously. <laughs> uh, the way it happened, uh, because you have to audition, obviously, to get into those courses. And because I was living in Italy, they uh, they said, oh, just send us a tape of you playing. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I got yeah. this really, these amazing couple of musicians from <laughs> from my uh, from my hometown. To play this, I played Scrapple from the Apple, I remember. And I literally wow. learned, like, I could just, I just about knew, so I could do sort of root knob third, fifth, you know, I could make very simple walking bass. And I practiced it for like months, just a single, just one tune, I practiced it. And they came to play, like, they recorded with me just for this one, uh, for my audition. Yeah. And, and um, this guitarist, Manu, Manu Randi, who is a pro- really amazing guitarist, who's just doing. <laughs> some incredible blowing over it <laughs> so i don't know whether they were thinking oh she plays with some really good people so probably <laughs> <laughs> that's always worth you got to get the 18 cats on your auditions man <laughs> it's the way in i sent them a tape that's how it works wow with the post through with like by post you know and they they accepted me i don't know maybe they were short of bass players or something as well i don't know but i literally was really you know when i started there i was nowhere near where anyone else was i'd only really played the bass for like a couple of years at that point you know right yeah so um yeah but i made it and you know i learned i practiced a lot as well during that time you know yeah i got got into i had an amazing teacher there also uh, called Stuart hall oh yeah i know Stuart. yeah oh he was just brilliant he made me he just was so inspiring and gave me music to listen you know stuff it, he, he could see what I was into I think and he would sort of give me stuff that he thought I, I might like and um, although yeah. it was, again he was far too advanced half of it for me but I still you know I still really into music from that time you know I got into I mean he's really he really got me into Hermeto Pascual and I was gonna say he's uh, yeah I was I mean, I still really love Brazilian music and South American music in general, but that I sort of got super inspired by that during that time. Mm. Mm. And were you writing at this point? Like, were you writing your own pieces? And, and I mean, I guess you said, like, I, even in these punk bands, you'd have been writing, right? Is it probably, yeah. is it always something that's run alongside playing for you? Yeah, 
I was always writing, you know, so, sometimes informed writing, sometimes completely not informed. And, <laughs> and uh, during that time, I was sort of, try- I think in my head, I sort of felt like I should be a jazz musician. And, you know, that's my path. And um, which now is, a di- I feel very differently about it. But at that time, that was where my head was at. You know, I wasn't really listening to punk music anymore. I was like, mm-hmm. I need to study like, walking bass lines i need to study soloing i need to you know be able to change yeah this kind of stuff and i found it really hard i still find it really hard and you know it's not something that came really natural to me and um so i was trying to be this kind of musician really um so my writing was like that as well you know mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. tried to write for on so, smaller ensembles or for some more like jazz bands and things like this um but yeah, um, formed little bands that never made it anywhere. But you know, it's all part of the. It totally is, yeah. Journey, it? So it's all valid and important yeah. to go through that as well. I learned a bit how to harmonize things, you know, and uh, simple things really. But it's 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 been great, you know. I, le- I learned so much in those three years. Yeah. So the free music, like. Right. Who was your introduction to that? How did that come about? Um, well, I, you know, there was like these modules at, these modules at university. So, and just uh, one time it was just about improvised music. And I really remember Chris Batchelor who was teaching that um, that module. And I, I'd never heard free improv before in my life. So it was mm-hmm. something completely alien. And I found it very hard to understand the concept of what, so you just like do what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking at the time, you know, and um, very sort of naive and not thinking, obviously, about the whole listening part or about the whole history of it or, you know, yeah, just coming from like a very small town place that doesn't really know much about music at all. And and I remember like we played, um, we played at that, at that class, he got us to play and I kind of took it that way, you know, just, just do what you want. You know, yeah. yeah any, anything goes. You know, I remember he was talking about like time no changes and things like this, and mm. and I just really loved it. And I went up and played, and I just started detuning my bass. And I was, and I was kind of like, how far can I go here before he tells me this? Is- <laughs> 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 but that's a good place to start, isn't it? How far can I push this? Yeah, and I really remember him saying to me afterwards. I really enjoyed when you started detuning the bass. That was great. And I was like, what? <laughs> that was really random. <laughs> well, you obviously hit upon something there. And I think that's like, you know, the idea of, I don't know, I think a lot of people who, who get into, who's first, you know, maybe their first experience of improvised music is in college or something. And they might just be like, what the fuck? And they might think, so you just do whatever you want and not actually kind of do it in a way. You know, I mean, it, like, we'll have a certain disdain for that or the, the lack of uh, the theory that they used to or something like that. Whereas you took that, even if you now might think it's a slightly reductive thing, but, you know, you could argue it's still perfectly true. You took that as a kind of like a green light, you know? Yeah, 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 totally, totally. I actually find it found it quite liberating, you know? Yeah. I think because, th- because I... I wasn't and still I'm not so good at like playing changes or, you know, I, I, um, I mean, now I understand that it really goes hand in hand, those two things as well, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with the not good at playing changes point constantly, but we'll gloss over that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not going to big yourself up, but yeah, that's, that's bollocks. Um, <laughs> Do you think uh, the like the punk hardcore side of you found an outlet in that music that maybe you hadn't had a link in previous improvised experiences with more jazz stuff? Yeah, completely. I was just going to say that, you know, I was suddenly allowed to connect to this part of myself again, which I was really repressing at that point. Yeah, yeah. Like... I felt like I wasn't, oh, I'm not supposed to play with a pick or, you know, I'm not supposed to... Who plays with a pick? Is <laughs> Ruth plays with a pick, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, it, it, at that time, you know, 
you hear things and and you think they're true because someone you respect told them or you know there's these opinions on it that don't really come from yourself but from yeah lots of other people and you don't know whether they've gone through your own filter you know they have well they yeah. haven't gone through the filter so it's um you, it, it took me a long time to rediscover myself in that way you know and uh, yeah only after i finished at Middlesex, I, I sort of rediscovered that part of myself and was like, this is what I want to do, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or maybe, yeah, seeing those worlds possibly combining for the first time, because that's a huge part of the sound. I mean, the, the sound with a pick, maybe let's get onto that, because that's like a very distinctive thing. Callum Gourlay, I think, was joking earlier on Twitter when he asked me to ask the question, what strings do you use? But it is about that, isn't it? Are they like, I remember one MYD gig where you've somehow forgot your bass and we managed to get you another short scale Mustang. And it was like an amazing old instrument, but it had like, I don't know what the electric bass equivalent of like gut strings on the double bass or something. It had totally the wrong sound. You remember? Yeah, it had flat wound strings on that. Yeah, they sound very dead. Whereas, um, you know, I like the pain. So you, I, I usually have um, the round wound, wound on the, the yeah. Uh, there's a lot more top end. Yeah, very bright strings that that ring, you know, that give you sustain. Yeah. I mean, I, I like flat rounds, but especially not for MYD. It, you know, it's not a good sound. No. It doesn't. It works for like sort of jazz, more jazzy stuff, I would say. But yeah, I don't, I don't really enjoy it, and I really hated that gig <laughs> because of that. <laughs> you know. I remember it being quite different. It was like there was just a whole element of the sound missing, you know. A lot of yeah. the attack comes from that as well, I think. Like, just it's just that kind of slightly ab abrasive edge to the sound when you drive it quite hard, and it's it's got that those upper partials in it. I suppose they're not really existent. Those other strings sound deader or something. I was listening today. I was going through your SoundCloud and finding inspiration for our chat. And uh, <laughs> right at the bottom, there's a really lengthy, heavy free up, but possibly with your writing there's definitely some writing of uh, you and Allsop and Kit and Tim. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, My, yeah. Is it called Big Cat? Yeah, that was the sort of first attempt of putting a band together. <laughs> right. Well, it's a pretty fucking heavy band. I I was on my, like, daily walk in the park and I had that on and it was just like... Oh, right. Oh, I mean, how, when was that? I can't even... It was probably I've like... got it here. It says 2011. Wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. Long time. So how long ago after that, how long after Middlesex are we then? You'd already been playing with Acoustic Ladyland, I think, by then, presumably. Yeah. That was like yeah. around the time I moved to London, like 2007, 2008, maybe. I probably started playing with um, with Pete, um, with Acoustic Ladyland, maybe around 2006 or something like that mm -hmm. I'm guessing now but probably about 14 14 to 15 years ago I think something like right. that right wow yeah and, uh, yeah, and you know Pete Pete and Seb as well have been a huge influence to my playing right you know, I, yeah I was really young like at the t playing wise young at, at the time when I started playing with them and I was playing in se with Seb in other projects before that and sort of became friends with him and He's like really been a big part in discovering my own sound, and you know, mm. we had we had a lot of. I I I realized what kind of music he was into, and what kind of musician he was, and realized that oh, he's into he's into that same music that I was into, like mm. you know, and he's like this kind of musician now, just like really amazing, all round like jazz musician, yeah. or there's all sort of music and. Yeah, and there is, really heavy. he hasn't got this label on him, and um, and he really, I, I don't know, he, he really pushed me and made me discover that. I, mean, I don't know whether he saw it as somewhere, you know, whether he felt like that was a part of me, and or you know, I, I don't know, I'd have to ask him, but um, he, he was very, very supportive at the time, and we did jam. <laughs> and you know he asked me to play with a pick and you know and I got back into playing with a pick and it, that was because of Seb right amazing and then 
he got me he you know i think he he suggested me to play with pete and we had a rehearsal and then you know just being in that band with with them at the time was it was just amazing you know i learned so much about music improvising and also my own my like me as a musician you know mm -hmm. what, what i want to do and and since then really i you know it's been a slow gradual journey back into it's okay to be a punk musician that oh i, I don't see myself as a punk musician as i see myself as a musician really and mm -hmm. you know don't I don't enjoy labels obviously we, nobody does anymore it's all one thing isn't it but I, I just it was okay then for me in my head to be playing different music and using a pick and having a distorted sound and you know and really yeah. enjoying it and it's like and I just felt so much more comfortable <laughs> yeah I was like oh my god this is great I you know I'm really enjoying this um because I used to give myself such a hard time about playing jazz and you know, and not not being able to improvise the way I felt like I should be able to. I mean, yeah, it's probably a very common thing that isn't it? I mean, maybe everybody. Does. I think so. Well, I mean, I, that, again, it might just be a jazz thing, but like, yeah, what you're meant to do or what the expected outcome of a thing is. You know, if you're playing this tune, then you probably, you know, you're going to play a certain way. Or yeah, I think there is baggage attached to it because, probably rightly, people are very, like. Uh, kind of respectful of the history of it, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and like the work of all of these crazy, these incredible musicians. But they, you know, I think it's so important at some point to be told that like you don't have to sound like that, or that it's actually more important for you to engage with that the way that you do, and not try and do kind of a cheap version of what somebody else does, or you know, yeah. to have those messages coming through, especially from someone, people like Seb and. And Pete, it's like, that's a very heavy thing. And then obviously a very nourishing thing as a musician to suddenly realize like, ah, oh, it's all right if I make a racket or, you know, yeah. if I just yeah. decide to make noise for a bit or if I don't play or, you know, all of these things yeah. that can be like, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of psychology involved with improvising and, and feeling comfortable with other people. And you have to definitely like finding out what you want to do and what you're happy doing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's such a huge part of it and I think it can take quite a long time sometimes yeah. and certainly different like relationships can bring that out in other ways you know like sooner than I don't know it's, these things don't happen for an accident I don't think like obviously that was the start of a very potent and amazing journey for you yeah but you know you know George the, the other thing that uh, then I found sort of um because you know when you when you say you say to yourself i'm i'm not really good at this or you know this is yeah yeah i lost you mid train of thought there but we're back uh, oh are we yeah you know that thing when you think like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really good at this, you know, it's, it's kind of, for me, it's like, am I just being lazy or, mm. because it's, it's hard work, right? To practice. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, you know, all the good people have like studied loads and, and, you know, done loads and loads of work on it. So, so it's just like, am I just being lazy and, and I'm just not doing that work or is it? Is it something else? Is it that, you know, maybe yeah. I am more yeah. myself doing a different kind of thing. It's a it's difficult. I don't, I still don't know. <laughs> I still don't no, know. It, there's not, I, there isn't really a right answer to that, I don't think. Like, cause sometimes I've definitely felt like exactly what you've said. And I know that I'm lazy and that people who are really good at certain musics that I don't feel like I can necessarily do, like they've worked really hard at that. It's not necessarily, some people are innately gifted but most people who are amazing at jazz or improvised music at a high level have worked incredibly hard to get to the point that where they're comfortable enough and fluent enough to just express what they want to do. Yeah. So you sort of, but then I think sometimes, and sometimes it is right to like really try something and then just be like, do you know what? I haven't found that much pleasure in mm. putting that hat on or, you know, or at least even worrying about these rules and then sometimes yeah. you just decide you've had enough and fuck it. And you, you end up playing like the best solo you've ever played on this tune that's been 
haunting you for six months or something, you know, because you just throw it all away. Like, there isn't really, I don't know if there's a right answer because you, you don't want to encourage people to just, you know, reject anything that makes them uncomfortable because so often that's the experience that leads to like something really amazing happening. But at the same time, yeah. there is, there's no use just flogging a dead horse if it's not making you happy. It's not maybe yeah. the one for you. That's it. I mean, the, the really eye-opening thing for me was, I mean, I still practice playing changes and, you know, I still like, when I sit down and practice, that's a lot what I practice, try to practice. Mm. I mean, I don't practice, but that's <laughs> what I do. I often practice like tunes or, you know, yeah. if I practice a double bass, jazz tunes and things like this. Um, so I still want it, I always want it to be part of my practice because I know it's really important yeah for any musician and, i'm the know, same actually but but what really was what really was an eye opener for me is when when i you know you get i get i get frustrated about like oh, fuck, i can't do this i can't you know i do a jazz gig and i just feel awful about it and mm. and i was speaking to kit and i was just like i'm really struggling like with this you know being able to play standards and feeling good about it and and he was, he said to me, you don't listen to that music at all. And, <laughs> and then I realized that that's so true, you know, and yeah. I hardly ever listen to it. I do, and I like it, but it's very, very, you know, it's very rarely that I listen to, to jazz. And with, yeah. with other things, like, there's something in me, I, I don't really have that passion that, yeah. And, and and then I felt so much better after that. I was glad to said that to me because um, I just felt relaxed about it. I was like, you know, that's my answer right here. You know, mm. how can you like be passionate about it, something and want to be something and try and get there? And if you not, if you instinctively don't even listen to that kind of music very much, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, yeah, use it as practice. Now I feel like I use it as practice. You know, I. You know, I still want it massively to be part of my playing, mm. but I don't want to feel bad about it and give myself a hard time about not, you know, not being like like Kit or like yourself or, you know, so, so good at that, like playing standards and um, it's okay, you know. Yeah. Ruthie, listen, we're going to get cut off in a second, but I think we should keep going a tiny bit longer if you're up for it. So yeah, okay. I'm going to stop this and start it again. I think that's what I have to do. Sorry, bear with us, everyone. And um, I will be right with you. Okay? Okay. See you in a sec. Right, bye. Bear with us. All right, we're back. But no one is yet watching. There she is. We're back. Good morning again, everybody. I hope you're all having a lovely afternoon, enjoying the chat. I'm rambling a bit, but you know. Hey. 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 We were just getting into something quite deep then. I don't know. Uh... Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I, I, got, I don't know about you, but I have, I have quite like, I have periods where I, it's it's like the most comfortable thing for me to do because I, I I I maybe more than you have like always had some sort of connection to that side of the music and it's always been a part of my kind of practice as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes where I just really feel like I can't connect with it and I'm desperate to do something else and I feel a bit like like you say like lazy or silly for saying that because I know that like there are people who fucking amazing at this stuff who work a lot harder than me but i just yeah if it's if it's if it's like not um if it's not the thing you're really feeling at that time then it's like it, it it can feel a bit tricky and then also when you have to do it like you say like your your thing now is like you're comfortable yourself uh saying well you know i i'm up for this and i enjoy playing but it's not really my most personal music like yeah. if it, it, I, I find sometimes to just have to be like, well, I'm going to have fun on this gig and basically do my impression of such and such a saxophonist and not really worry about 
saying something for myself you know or something like that i think actually in the world of like standards and kind of post bebop music i unless it's like newer stuff and people's writing for bands i'm in i'm quite happy just like actually putting on my 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 very thin john coltrane hat or my sunny rollins impression or my stan gets impression and just having a nice time you know and that's that I get a lot more out of that music that way and I sometimes I still sometimes find myself thinking oh I did something I haven't done there before like let's investigate that when I'm back in the in the at home or something like that you know so finding whatever that thing is that allows you just to enjoy it and not stress about it and not let it cause you ang- too much grief really anxiety because it's all just a barrier in in the way of what you're actually trying to do which is hopefully yeah. make some nice music with other people <laughs> And you know, I start. I started whenever I was doing the jazz gig. I, I kind of started really to feel down on myself, and uh, and now I'm quite selective with those kind of gigs. And I, again, I was speaking to Kit a lot about this. You know, he really helped me to um, just think about this kind of stuff. You know, and made me feel okay about helped me feeling okay about that. And mm. I started saying no to certain gigs. That, I, I could feel, you know, you can feel inside you, like, sometimes you get asked to do a gig and, uh, and you're like, oh, I really should be doing this, this is going to be great. Yeah. Then, oh, I'm going to be like, this is just not right for me, you know, I'm not the right, I'm not the right person for this, I don't think. And, and in the last, in the last couple of years, there have been a few occasions like that where I've turned down, like some, you know, where I've turned down some really good, really good gigs and I'm so glad I, I did because... Yeah. I just wouldn't have been right for it. And you, you know, I mean, it, it probably would have been all right, but I probably wouldn't have felt, <laughs> felt all right about it myself. Mm. So it's not worth it, you know? No. And again, it's a fine line because, you you know, I don't want to limit myself in, in that you don't want to sort of make, you know, get scared, go back, you know, don't go out, don't, don't, don't risk anything because I still want to, I still want to risk stuff and get myself into situations where I don't know what to expect and, you know, because ma- magical things happen then as well. I think mm. it's good to trust your instincts as well and uh, just know what is for you and what isn't for you, you know. Yeah, totally. And and that's another thing. I'm so glad I started I started saying no sometimes and just yeah. like, what, I, here is the number. <laughs> of yeah. It would be really good and, you know... <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's me and a lot of that kind of stuff happened with like you know for instance playing standards on double bass you know I'm not yeah. a double bass player like Callum is or you know people that are really good at that stuff and I, I I'm I'm not so um, putting myself into in a situation like really high profile playing with people that are really good at that I I, I don't I, you know it's not it's not right for me it's there's a lot mm-hmm. Hold on, I'm gonna to have to go and get my charger. That's it. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna leave. <laughs> yeah, please don't leave us. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> so cool. <laughs> yeah. So where do we get up to? We're sort of still. We've 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 kind of blurred a few years here and there. But you've you've played with Pete and Seb and did Pete find? Did how did how did how did you meet these people in the first place? Were you still a Middlesex student when didn't Pete like hear you at college or something like that? No, I think Pete, I met him just slightly after that. Um, I met Seb when I was at college and we started playing ah, maybe that's uh, it. with uh, Johnny Phillips uh, in his band called Oriel. We were playing together. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, that's where I met Seb and the, and then after that, I moved to Brixton, and um, and then we started playing. And then I started playing with uh, with Pete and Lady Land. And yeah, was that the Morville Roadhouse? Yeah, Have, did you? Yeah, have I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I went there a few times actually. Yeah, I think. That, yeah. You know, we used to man, we used to rehearse in there with Lady Land, like in this. We had this tiny, you know, it's like a terraced house, yeah. Yeah. Is this? We had this tiny little practice room in there, and we used to rehearse in there for like six, seven hours. <laughs> wow. So loud. And I was just thinking the other day, I don't know why I thought about it, but I remember it and thought, my gosh, like, there was like six people living in the house, you know, and we'd just do these rehearsals like full on. <laughs> <laughs> 
and the neighbours, no, no one ever complained. I don't know how on earth we got away. No, sometimes you just get a lucky. I'm very aware of that stuff at the moment because um, we've got really lovely neighbours, but they're all working from home at the moment. And like, there's only a reasonable amount of loud noise, I feel like, you know, is, is acceptable. And I, yeah. I, you know, it's, ma it's mad to think that a few years ago when I was in that big house in Golders Green, we used to, it was the same thing. There'd be like a rehearsal in the shed in the back garden and a rehearsal in the front room, like most days. And sometimes like really heavy. I remember once, uh, do you remember that band Splice? With like uh, Robin okay. Finker and Dave and Bonnie. It was really fun, like, well, quite dark electro acoustic improv thing. And they were rehearsing in the front room with like, this PA had this massive bass amp and, I was just leaving the house and like this huge drone like finally came to a finish as they finished this like 25 minute piece or something. And then you could just hear someone teaching a beginner piano student in the room directly above upstairs, like twinkle, twinkle <laughs> comes like plinking out. It's just like, oh, that poor child. That's going to scar them forever. Or maybe it will wake them up to something they never even knew about. But it's kind of, it's a weird environment. You can just get, yeah. I guess your neighbours, hopefully they were probably out a lot of the time. I don't know. I, I played in that room a few times and it wasn't big. It's tiny, isn't it? Oh, my God. My ears <laughs> used to ring so much. <laughs> bonkers, yeah. That was really good fun, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we've kind of talked about strings and uh, we got up to various things acoustic ladyland is sort of next isn't it someone on twitter asked valerie lynch said how does she manage to jump between styles so seamlessly and be a badass at them all oh <laughs> so there <laughs> um i think it's i mean we all play lots of different styles of music don't we i suppose and you just kind of learn how to make it your own isn't it yeah yeah i wonder if it's yeah maybe a, a way to phrase that differently might be like do you think there's a kind of common thread but that runs in between all of the stuff that you like or do they speak to different parts of your kind of musical personality or or perhaps how do you go about finding yourself in it all sorry that's really big questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i i can't i think i just feel like i want to be myself in all of them you know and even if that means that the style becomes something slightly different but it stays oh. the same if it stays still it's it's um, yeah. it feels like where's the point in doing it to me at least you know I'm I feel like I'm big into new things and I feel you know I, I always crave writing things that are very different or you know or mm. I, I like things that are very different things that I've never heard before or even um, like combinations of musicians you know I'm, at the moment mm. I'm into like weird coming like weird combinations of um, of people playing together you know different setups like other than the usual i don't know whatever you know yeah comes something and and it's, in, it's interesting it's, it's good to to find new sounds it, i don't know i mean that's you know that's just the way i feel because i i speak about that with other people sometimes and um this one friend of mine was saying, why does it have to be me, you know? Mm. Because I always was like, yeah, I want to write something or I want to do something that's really different or very innovative. And, and, um, and he was like, why does it have to be new, you know? And I didn't really know mm. what to say to that because it's true. Why does it have to be new? That's just yeah. what I feel, you know? It's, there's no truth in that necessarily. It's, it's just what I personally want to hear in music you know yeah mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I kind of I I've felt bothered by that before of like writing a piece and just oh, it's it's all it's all this has been done before or something like that but then there is a lot to be said for like new for you it doesn't have to be new for necessarily anyone else does it like if you find a certain energy in it or inspiration then that's that's like a pretty good starting point 
So yeah. now I try and worry less about like what I don't really know if anything is that new. Uh, but if it's something that I haven't looked into before and it really grabs me and that's if basically if something makes me if I go to practice or play and all of a sudden like 90 minutes has passed and I haven't really noticed it then I probably want to carry on doing whatever that thing is because <laughs> it has some yeah. sort of allure or like like a certain gravity to it and you can just lose yourself in it for for a while um you mentioned a second ago we're jumping ahead a bit here but uh, I'll allow it. Um, uh, interesting groups and sort of setups, and so I guess that might bring us on quite neatly to Skiller, your latest project, mm-hmm. um, because it's quite an unusual lineup. And I guess perhaps for people who know you through Melt or Acoustic Ladyland or even Golden Age of Steam, we didn't get to talk about that yet, um, or Volaviel, like. A, a very a starkly different sound and sound world um mm-hmm. what how did that all come about skilla you mean yeah yeah um it was a coincidence um <laughs> <laughs> like um i yeah basically kit did i don't know if you remember kit this is thing called this is our music where he Oh, it's yeah. like a monthly uh, sort of he basically once a month mixtape yeah mixtape that's the right word uh, he asked a group of people to and uh, he asked me to be part of that as well and so I was like yeah okay cool I'm gonna yeah. you know and I at the time I was I just remember how it happened. I took the bass. I just started playing around with harmonics and my bass, my bass was detuned because it was in the case. So randomly detuned. And um, mm. I just really enjoyed the, the the set of harmonics that I was getting from it. And I was just like, right, I'm just going to do something with this. You know, this sounds really nice. Mm. Um, and then I just put some layers of vocals on top of it and, because I heard phrases. It was basically, it's just basically an improvised phrase. Mm. And I put some layers of vocals on top of it. And suddenly I had this thing of like detuned harmonic bass with four or five different layers of vocals on it. And... Because of the way that things will hold over whatever you're playing on the other string, you get different held notes quite randomly mm. as well. And I tried to do the same with the vocals, you know, so holding different mm-hmm. notes, but having other melodies on top of it and then holding in different places, basically. on and um, and then next month I I just did another one I sort of randomly t- is that then you know mm. it, was, it was kind of random but also if I did you know if, if I didn't like the tuning of it then I would work on the tuning and find a tuning that I really like where I get a really nice harmonic series and um, right so first time it was completely random and then I started obviously it was a bit more uh, calculated Maybe, mm. maybe not the right word but you know it was still very improvised because a lot of the phrases are improvised mainly the yeah things i did and uh, but yeah yeah then i started working on 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 the tunings and uh and that do i did that for like a year then because it was like one tune a year right and uh i basically had an album together then after yeah. that and uh so it kind of started out as a solo project, and then I, you know, Pablo held the, the piano. Yeah. The, yeah. He, he one day asked me if I wanted to perform at the festival in Cologne, at the Cologne Jazz Festival, with this project. And obviously, I didn't have a band, you know, so I was like, good. And I had like four or five different layers of vocals as well. So how am I going to do that? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm, sure I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And then I just started, how how can I do this live, you know? And um, I was like, right, 
I need some singers and it was quite obvious who I was going to ask immediately because right? uh, Alice Grant is really good friends of mine for very long. Oh, oh stay with us, folks. Have we lost her? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. You were <laughs> saying you and Alice, uh, uh, Alice is an amazing singer and you've been friends for a long time. I guess you'd already done uh, Normal Gimbal together right, yeah. in the years before this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done Normal Gimbal. So, you know, I was totally hearing her in, in this music. Yeah. And, and uh, Lauren as well. I, you know, I've been a fan of Lauren's for a long time. I love her voice so much. And I just thought... Yeah. This is going to work, you know, and I'm really glad because they didn't know each other before. So I kind of felt like, you know, putting singers together, you want them to really get on as people and mm. but also be really happy singing together. So and you just don't know. I mean, I, I, I had a feeling it was going to be fine and it, it's great. I think they get on really well and they I think they really like singing. Together. Yeah, I bet. But yeah, so we did that first gig. So now, and... when you play live, and... oh sorry, I think we were kind of no. um, a bit delayed. Yeah. Do you... yeah, do the tunings? Do you have to like retune for different songs, or do the harmonics shift depending on like? Do you... now that you've formalised these things into pieces, I suppose are they all? You like there's no randomness now to the the harmonics and the kind of the structure of it all. No. The pieces are the pieces now, so it's. Yeah. Uh, I had to then go back and transcribe the whole thing, and often I did write the tuning down. So there's still some things I've been trying to work out. What fucking tuning I've been using? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know which string you are. It takes ages. So it's. Wow. Because it, it was all improvised, so I, I didn't. Yeah, I just didn't write it down at the time. So, um, but yeah. Back to your question. Every tune has got a different tuning. I need to tune between each tune. Oh, wow. So you either stick with it, you know, that's just part. I've, I've sort of, at the beginning, I was like, oh, my God, people are going to have to wait, you know, between each tuning. And there's ways around it now. We, we improvise a lot now as well because they are both great okay, improvisers yeah. as well. So they can do vocal improvising while, while I can, like, hold down some freeze note. Well, you know, yeah. there's, there's ways around it. And sometimes... I just stop and I just tune and people just wait. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's that it is kind of part of the music, you know, in a way. So. Yeah, well, that's yeah, exactly. It's part of the process, isn't it? It wouldn't. There's no. There's no other way around that until you're doing like world tours and you've got a bass tech and you've got like eight different basses <laughs> on a rack at the back of the stage. <laughs> I'm sure it's only a little way away. Exactly. <laughs> It sounds amazing, though. And I remember, actually, I think it would have been, I can't remember now, whenever we played that place with Melt in Hackney Wick, Studio 92, 94, you were sound checking. And you were, yeah, you were doing that. I, I'd, I think I'd heard some of these pieces when I was listening to the This Is Your Music series, but you were just in sound check. You were just stacking up the harmonics and singing the top voice or, like, picking out a lower voice. And it was just like, oh, what's this? It just <laughs> sounds, it's, it's immediately, like, very different to... Like, yeah, I can't think of too many things that, like, it reminds me of it. It's like my ears just immediately kind of light up, you know. It's mm. a very ethereal and very pure sound. Mm. And again, I guess it has a lot to do with, like, your bass sound and sustain and, mm. and like, upper partials, um, higher, higher frequency information in the sound and stuff like that. It's really, it's really different and, and very special, I think. Mm. It's like one of those things that you just kind of go, oh, I've got to figure out what that is or what that does or something like that. Are there lots of plans for that? I guess it's difficult for anyone to have too many concrete plans right now. But um, what's the what's the what's happening with Skiller next? Oh, have we gone? We slipped out again. Yo. Hello. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a, a, a finished a record. Of Woo! That. So that's all done. Um, I'm just sort of looking for a label now, but as you say, it's a really bad time for all of that because no one knows what's happening. But yeah, uh, Kit 
produced it. So he's done lots of amazing production work on it. Um, oh, lovely. Yeah. Um, so it's all it's all finished. Really. Amazing. Just need to come out. I'm sort of hoping this year at some point, um, maybe towards the end of the year. Um, but yeah, depending yeah. on how things are going, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty tough to plan too far ahead at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. We're kind of hoping that it'll be everything's going to be fine. I'm sure it will. <laughs> um, yeah, I was so I was going to ask actually, Kit, you said did some production on that, but when you were like taping these, recording these things, a boring nerd question, are you working in logic or? Yeah. And so I, I was again when I was doing my research today and listening to your SoundClouds, it went straight into that quite bonkers remix you did of uh, Vullaville years ago. Oh, yeah. Was that all cut together in Logic as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I work in I love that, man. It's very rude. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Are you, do you, I mean, you should do more remixing stuff. Or, like, production, I think. You know, I'm... It's the same. I'm, like, a total beginner with remixing. It's all very instinctual and... I'm not a good tech person, as you well know. Um, so it's very difficult mm. to understand mixing, and you know, I can I can do very basic things on on Logic, and that's why I do a lot of like chopping up and gluing together and things like this. Um, but yeah, yeah. I love doing. Yeah, some... Corey wants me to do a remix. I just see, yeah, I'm up for it, Corey. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you've got a commission. I quite like the fact. I guess it's like. In the, the the term of, I mean, I've never really tried to do this. The, the, the sort of the the concept of remixing is so broad that you can kind of come at it with whatever you want anyway. And sometimes, mm -hmm. really, what what some you know, like I'm a bit similar to you with Ableton. Um, I can get it to do roughly what I want it to do, and hopefully, it sounds all right. <laughs> and um, but like, I'm not super developed with it. But it seems in that kind of world, like sometimes quite basic techniques done you know with the right intention and like quite stark and direct things can really work and there's a lot more openness to like sort of how you do it and your approach is as much about this as much about that as it is like the material or the, the sort of end result in the way isn't it yeah. and i usually enjoy making something completely different with with it yeah you know, i don't i hardly ever make a track i think probably would have would have helped track was the most uh, uh, done, done any of the remixes that I've done usually they just become completely new tunes of music new, new uh, pieces of music yeah well I mean it was pretty it's, it was probably the most different of all of the ones on that little remix EP I think oh really okay. yeah quite similar actually that one well I mean I don't know the notes. The notes are all there, but you you put it in fifteen or something, didn't you? <laughs> it was in it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like you maybe you may succeeded in finding a, a rhythm that even Vullaville hadn't played at that point. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, that's the way I heard it in my head. That really. When I listen to that tune, I mean, I know it's not like that, but that's yeah. the initial part of that of that groove. That's where I felt the beat was for ages. So I, I made it yeah. made it like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's wicked. I hadn't heard it in years, and it was just like it came screaming into my headphones when I was in the park, and it was another one of those. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it's got a really out little intro as well, like, and then just straight into this really heavy. <laughs> collection of drum chops like it's, it's really cool super vibey and again like that's i mean i guess that that kind of diy thing's quite punk isn't it like this sort of you, you know just chops and and making a new thing i like that yeah it's very hip well it sounds like you've got another one coming from cory so yeah. <laughs> if we can look forward well, to that soon funny, Corey. times are tough <laughs> we got a what no, it was just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Show some, 
Flash the cash, mate. Uh, <laughs> we're getting up to the hour and a half mark, Ruthie, so I guess yeah. we should start thinking about maybe winding this thing down. Neither of us yeah. thought we'd even get this far, but it's been lovely, I have to say. A few oh. internet problems notwithstanding. Sorry, you no, threatened no. earlier... No, 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 it's absolutely fine. It may even be me. I don't even know. Uh, you threatened earlier that you had, like, an amplifier and your bass set up somewhere. Yeah. So maybe... Do you want to like give us a little? Sure, I'm going to go. A little, rit- a little rhythm changes to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go upstairs. Key of your choice. So the, I don't know whether the connection is going to cut out again, but hopefully not. Oh yeah, that could be quite frustrating, but we'll give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. What's? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's things I haven't. There's there's loads of stuff I haven't asked about really but we've covered quite a lot of your um certainly your your musical life up to a point where people might already have an idea about what's going on if people i mean you're all myd followers so you know about all of that stuff but uh other bands ruth plays in you should check out the the aforementioned volaviel let's spin uh we didn't talk about let's spin but they're amazing people and they've just got a new record out on fp from manchester great independent jazz and improvised music label uh maybe more improvised music than jazz i don't know if they'll hate me for saying the word the j word but it's a movable feast and um yeah what else golden age of steam welcome to backcountry that's one of my favorite records that you might not have heard from the world of wonky british jazz and improvised music so check those all out how are you getting on there ruth we've kind of got can you see we me can see you just can you see me we can see the bottom half of you yeah there you go Wait, I'm sure <laughs> Do you want to see my face or my feet? Um, Shall we have a vote? (laughs) Face or feet? I think face. Am I? uh, Okay. Give the the people what they want. How about that? Yeah, that's wicked. Another vote for feet. Someone says feet. Oh, Bex wants That's Bex. It's half Bex. I'll do one one for you with the feet later. (laughs) Okay, we have a compromise. Hey, Bex. Can you hear me? Yeah, go.
<laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Ruth. Shall we leave it there then? We could. Nice There's lots and lots we didn't get to talk about, but hopefully there'll be many more of these kind of things. And uh, I think tomorrow, Ruth, are you, you're interviewing Kush, right? Yeah, I'm interviewing Kush tomorrow. So, anything so you the, want to uh, the M let Ruth know your questions and the, the M. It's at 6 tomorrow, 6, 6 p.m. Uh, you heard it here first, 6 p.m. tomorrow. And uh, yeah, join us again as the MYD band interviews continue. Thanks all for staying with us today and for uh, your shouts below and nice comments. And thanks so much to Ruth. And we'll catch up thanks, with you very Paul. soon. Lots nice of love stuff. in a bit. Yeah, love. Bye. Yes. Yeah. Bye. In a bit. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Oh.